Good morning and evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us from different parts of the world for the second webinar session of Convergex Conversation Series. We are glad to have you today. Before we begin the session, I would like to inform you that you may use the Q&A chat box to ask any questions you may have, and they will be answered at the end of the session. Now, please join me in welcoming Deeksha Vats, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer of Aditya Birla Group, who would be moderating this session. Diksha is leading the sustainability agenda for Aditya Birla Group across all its locations on strategic, operational, communication, and advocacy aspects. She is a civil engineer with masters in environment science and engineering. Diksha is a sustainability professional with over 25 years of experience in both consulting and corporates at group and company levels. She has worked across diverse industry sectors, such as heavy and general manufacturing, utilities, retail, telecom, financial institutions, government bodies, and multilateral funding agencies. Her focus areas for these engagements have primarily been climate change, energy mix transition, water risk mitigation, waste and contaminated site management, resource conservation, biodiversity, and forestry. Diksha, I welcome you to take on the session. Thank you. Thank you, Sanskriti. Uh, very excited to be here. And I welcome you all in this, uh, uh, you know, very engaging session that uh, we, we put together for you on an accelerated shift to sustainable materials and products what were what are the implications for the non-woven industry specifically here on on viscose fiber uh, before introducing you uh, to our key speaker for today uh, let me take a few minutes to brief you all on uh, why are we here what is this converges convergex conversations uh, convergex is a platform to bring the non-woven value chain together so that we could ideate innovate and network with the industry peers. The first edition, which uh, I hope uh, many of you would have attended, was in 2018 in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, it was in uh, pre-COVID times, uh, so it was uh, it was physically attended and very well received by the all the value chain partners uh, who had uh, who were present there. And uh, taking this forward now in this new avatar uh, where we are. Uh, uh, digitally there with you. We are initiating this webinar series so that we can keep those conversations going uh, in this new normal that we are all in. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce you to our key speaker for this session. Please welcome uh, Tapio Milgen, who is an associate partner at McKinsey and Company in their Finland office. Tapio is focusing on strategy, M&A and growth with clients uh, to drive the shift to zero carbon economy in materials and energy. Tapio also serves clients on carbon-based circularity across physical goods value chain. Prior to working for McKinsey, Tapio had founded a natural food startup, so you can keep your questions on foods maybe towards the end. He holds an MSc from uh, Alta University in Economics and Business Administration, uh, SEMS MIM from Alto University and Xinhua uh, uh, University. Uh, Tapio, please correct me if I got it. Uh, you know, I hope I got it correct. Uh, Tapio's recent experience includes uh, a lot of work that he's done around corporate strategy for sustainable materials and fuel players, a portfolio strategy for a conglomerate which has been active in waste management business. He's worked on fiber-based packaging innovation and growth, sustainability transformation at an FMCG. Uh, he's worked on growth strategy in uh, in bio-based plastics, chemicals, and personal care ingredients. He's done strategy and fund setup for a battery value chain investment. So, so you can see the kind of uh, very diverse experience that type Tapio brings with him. So, it's over to you, Tapio, to talk to us about uh, you know the topic for today. Uh, over to you, Tapio. Thank you, Deeksha. 
so great to um, have the time with you. Let me let me take the presentation on um, and in the meanwhile, uh, the topics I was um, hoping to uh, talk about today is first briefly, what is the overall uh, overall focus on an, uh, when it comes to sustainability and biodiversity, sharing also some of our uh, recent recent research and, and studies on those topics. Then talk about the acceleration that we see in the industry, whether that's countries, whether that's regulation, whether that's consumers, whether that's uh, the different brand owners and companies. And, and then uh, the, uh, the key part of the discussion, um, I think it's going to be what are the implications for non-woven. And there it's especially what is uh, the sustainable material used in, in different non-woven applications. It's second, uh, how do you then produce it, uh, energy, water, uh, different resource management, and then three, how do you prove it? So what is the way to transparently show that you are doing uh, the right things? When, when I work uh, with different clients uh, towards zero carbon uh, economy and towards sustainable materials, there's always the discussion on what is going to be the pace of change what do we believe in, in decarbonization? And, and this is very much to me a, a decision a company needs to also have internally. What is the outlook that you believe in? Do you expect continued uh, growth of emissions? Do you expect that we will manage uh, to, to limit the uh, decarbonization to a certain degree? And how do, how do those uh, decisions impact uh, your choices of materials? your scope one and two and three emissions, uh, what are the targets, then towards 2050. There's also uh, a question not only around CO2 emissions and the global warming, but the implications for the biodiversity, which is extremely important when it comes to carbon intensive industries from natural carbon using our natural uh, lands and forests, which is the case for non-woven. We did recently a uh, climate risk report uh, highlighting what is it at stake, what is at stake uh, with, with global warming uh, and with, with the different impacts it may have on also biodiversity. Uh, questions arise such as will India um, get rich before uh, the possible heat waves that may come from global warming? Make, make living and economic operation uh, in, the, in the region challenging. There can be questions around food supply. There can be questions around uh, resilient supply chains. Will, for instance, hurricanes or floods impact how we, how we orchestrate our supply chains? It also impacts uh, how do different regions and the life there look like, such as Mediterranean region, which also would be potentially highly impacted if we don't manage to, uh, to cut the emissions and then global warming. On the biodiversity side, there's also a question then, what is, what is the world going to look like after uh, our generations? How much of the natural capital, how much of the biodiversity is left uh, if, we, if we end up uh, reaching uh, more than uh, 1.2 or 2 degree warming for the planet? Related issue uh, to, to the non-woven industry is also the water use. We, we see that with, with warming, uh, but also with, uh, with the water resources that, that we have, that there are many regions uh, in, in the world where the water stress is becoming uh, increasingly a um, major topic uh, for these regions, both uh, from, uh, from the population perspective, but also from the economic activities, and how do you then manage uh, the closed loop systems. Then if we look at what's, what do we see in the industry, I would say if you would have, if you would have um, asked 2017, what will 2050 look like? We all know that the, the answer would have been quite different. We see acceleration across different sectors across different stakeholders. And, and this also implies uh, that the answers uh, to sustainability and sustainable materials is, uh, is chasing at a rapid pace. On the climate ambition, we have seen over the past year 
since COVID, acceleration in China, Japan, South Korea, USA, European Union, with all of these regions setting 2050 or 2060 ambitions are on, on carbon neutrality or net zero. On the other hand, uh, regulators understand that it's not only a uh, well-performing, well-working well, uh, well um, overall sector agnostic uh, measures that will help uh, to push the, push the change, but it's also a question, how can we have specific regulation uh, that, that helps to uh, tackle some of the issues which may not be uh, solved with the system itself. One, ex uh, one example being the EU SUP, which is very relevant question also for the non-woven industry. Looking at consumers, I would say that there is quite interesting change uh, going on with cons consumers and sustainability. There has been for quite long time discussion on what is the preference of consumers towards sustainability? And in the past, you might have said that consumers are saying they prefer it, but they are not willing to pay for it. This is something that we increasingly see moving into willingness to pay. It's, it's building up from a couple of trends on the market. One is the environmental consciousness and a an, um, realization of the consumers, what they, how, what, are, what is the consumer they want to be? They are looking for products with sustainable origin avoiding animal testing, uh, being interested in the CO2 footprint, and also uh, knowing that the products are actually traceable. At the same time, sustainability is becoming everyday for them, which means that um, sustainability can be premium, but it can be also mass market. And many brands are pursuing sustainability because they see that with sustainability, uh, those brands are growing faster than the, than the brands that, uh, that do not leverage this value promise. Relevant to non woven you also have questions around consumer safety and true claims and unnatural free from something um, different uh, claims, meaning that the consumers are increasingly um, aware of the different issues you may have uh, with different materials. Many of these are more related uh, to um, either biomaterial use or then different chemical compounds that can be uh, can be seen as harmful, for instance, for your skin. Then if you look at the companies, uh, brand, brands of the world, a lot of the uh, changes also um, coming from the industry itself. We see a huge acceleration of, of different corporate targets regarding their scope one, two, and three, or science-based targets or renewable energy targets. Many companies have al already joined more than 1,000 on the SBT targets, and you see a lot of the both large, uh, large companies, brand owners, but also industrial and smaller players uh, becoming increasingly specific on what is their target and how they are going to uh, achieve that. This, of, of course, only covers um, the emissions footprint, but at the same, uh, same time, if you ask what's going to happen with biodiversity, I'm very much looking forward to seeing what are the SBTs related uh, to biodiversity targets that are being uh, worked on and how quickly those will be adopted by different brands. Lastly, before moving into, into non-woven, if we look at what the large brand owners are, uh, what they are doing and what is their focus on, on raw materials, on packaging, different carbon, uh, carbon elements in their, in their products. We see increasing focus on, on the supply chains, and this means ingredients and raw materials, focusing the CO2, for instance, L'Oreal having 50% reduction target for, uh, for the strategic suppliers by 2030. We see traceability uh, promises, and, and these can also relate to deforestation, um, so forestry-related targets, which are again very relevant for the entire one and two suppliers in, in non-woven. Similar uh, dynamics you see in packaging, uh, a rush away from plastics or towards recycled or otherwise sustainable, for instance, bio-based plastics. So that as an, as an intro, um, to 
to where where we are coming uh, coming uh, go from the sustainability and biodiversity, and then the acceleration in the industry before raising raising the questions in in non-woven. Anything, Diksha, you would like to emphasize or or raise at this point before moving on? No, thank you, uh, Tapu. I think that uh, kind of uh, gives an excellent context to why are we here? You know, uh, what has been happening, what mega trends we are seeing. And uh, as you said that, uh, you know, uh, one thing which is, uh, uh, which is both expected and unexpected, which has happened in the pandemic is, is this acceleration. That, you know, before the pandemic, uh, if we would have talked about that, if there would be an, uh, a time like this, uh, one would have thought that sustainability related initiatives would take a backseat, but it has actually got accelerated. So I'm curious to kind of, you know, because we, we spoke about what we spoke about consumers, we are in the midst of a pandemic, you know, uh, you are in Europe and, um, you know, the, from many countries, we still hearing that it's not that it's 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 kind of slowed down a bit, but continues to be around. So, you know, uh, if I was to link it to a, a sustainable development goal with this background, how do you see, uh, you know, the balance of responsible production and responsible consumption play out uh, uh, in the context that we are in? I think it's an excellent question. And um, if you look at the shift that happened over the past year during COVID times, there was a lot of uncertainty. How will world look like after the pandemic is over? And I think it's it's remarkable at what pace different regions and countries, but also corporations, then said that we want to see a quite different outcome when we come out of the crisis. So uh, there's a lot of initiative from from politicians, from uh, from corporations, from the private sector. Uh, the question for me on the consumers, um, it, it lays, lays quite a bit on how will consumption look like in the future? And one question I always like to like to ask, if you look at the disposable income of people, how much people consume on food, how much they consume on, on clothing or, or different, uh, different non-woven products, for instance, the share of, of the money people have disposable have been decreasing over the past decades and then shifting to different types of services. If you if you look at the cost of of fixing uh, the global warming issues or biodiversity issues, it is not that huge on the global scale. And for me, the implication is that consumers, if they are willing to pay a, a bit more uh, and, and revert a few years back on on the share of the disposable income, how much they were they were spending on 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 food and, and clothing, for instance. It's, it's, it's definitely part of the solution. And then if you look at what is actually happening in the market, is the growth of those sustainable brands. So we do see that it's it's a way offering those sustainable products is a way uh, to arouse uh, the, the consumer interest and then and then build growth to the brands, especially from those those parts of the uh, of the consumer segment who are more willing to make the right choice. So I think it's it's both. And it's uh, none of this that happens in isolation, and it can be also a positive spiral for me. What what the corporations are doing, what are the consumer choices, and what are also then the different states uh, and regulators doing? No, thank you, Tapio, for sharing that. I guess I, I quite like uh, the the thought that uh, you put uh, in there, saying that it, is it setting us on a virtuous cycle? That you know. Uh, pandemic has shown us the mirror to say that uh, it is it is our sustainability which is at uh, uh, which is what we're talking about. Uh, you know, nature takes care of itself in various ways, and therefore, to get that balance between are we ready to uh, kind of you know as consumers uh, shell out uh, that uh, that little extra money that is needed, or or even. Uh, that that shift in the the share of portfolio and uh, therefore how producers or the brands and policymakers respond to it. So no, thank you. I think uh, uh, th that would provide an excellent uh, 
segue into what the priorities for non-woven should be. Uh, Tapio, uh, another question I have because you know you ended your that section talking about you said Lord, whether it's L'Oreal or Unilever, were the two examples th that you used. Do you think supply chain traceability would lead to why are these companies doing that? Would you think that would lead to a better consumer trust and a better consumer demand? So, so that would be another point staying with because you said uh, focus on supply chain and therefore focus on traceability. So that would be uh, 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 another thought that I would want you to pick up and talk about and then we can talk about uh, non woven so, so over to you, Tapio, for that question. So on, on traceability, I would I would split that question in two. What is what is it that brand owners have to do, and what is it that they can do? And and for me, what what they have to do uh, builds from the necessity of of consumer willingness for sustainability um, to to comply what what you expect the market market to require from you. It's very very hard. Um, to take take a position in the market and and say that while others are accelerating, I'm doing nothing and I'm taking the risk that certain parts of the consumer base, whether that's younger generations, whether that's certain geographic uh, regions, where I'm putting my my brand at risk. So for that reason, I would say that meeting meeting the expectations on traceability um, and sustainability is is a must have. But then if you ask what uh, what brands can do. That's that's for me a question of the strategic positioning. There's increase, increasingly opportunities uh, to capture that premium part of the market by offering um, solutions that are zero carbon or that have other sustainability promises, which are truly distinct from other um, other products in the market. Uh, you, for instance, start to see uh, taking an example from other industries. Uh, it could be green steel or, uh, or automotive industry. Uh, do we see? Uh, do we foresee that that consumers would be willing to uh, to pay more, and especially automotive companies willing to pay more if they have completely carbon-free cars, including batteries and, and 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 the metals in the car? And this is something that some steel players are choosing as a strategy. You you can also, if you look at the packaging players, some of them clearly want to position themselves as fully closed-loop systems with chemicals and water. But also saying that we are carbon neutral at the same, even some some going carbon negative with uh, with CCUS, for instance. And so that can be also then it, it's a must have, but it's it's also what what you can do in terms of the positioning and then creating new products that increasingly you can capture a premium on. No, great. Thanks. Thank you, Tapu, for that explanation, and look forward to your uh, you know. What do you think are the priorities for non-woven users? So, thank you, Dixon. So, three points I'd like to talk about out of six six topics. In I'm personally always <laughs> enthusiastic about different new materials and and the novel innovation that you can build from the industry. So that's that's one point on the sustainable and circular material mix. What are the products? What are the materials that you use? And, and how how can you create interesting end, end products also for, for the consumer markets? Uh, second second point is how do you then create those materials? How do you make sure that you have closed closed loop water usage? You have renewable energy and, and chemicals. And what what are the challenges? How do you tackle uh, these these topics? And then third. How do you prove that you actually are doing this? And it's it's definitely not not simple. It is something that many large brand owners and companies are working very actively today, trying to develop this full traceability along the value chain. There are other topics which are important uh, on the social side, um, secure work environments, uh, better wage systems. How do you bring digitalization and, and the industrial revolution um, into that game? But in, when it comes to biodiversity and sustainability, I would I would then focus on these three topics. The framing where I come to textile industry is that like plastics industry, for instance, it is not yet really circular. Only rough, roughly one percent of the materials are, are truly circular today, which means that um, it, it goes through from virgin feedstocks 
and, and move through uh, in the textile industry um, through, the, through the clothing value chain and then comes back uh, to the clothing value chain. There's obviously a lot of downcycling or cascaded recycling, um, which, which is a bit more than 10% of the overall volumes that are then be, being used elsewhere, which is also a positive thing. But in, in overall, the focus, focus in circular economy should be to try to try to innovate and find new ways of using the materials that get into the system and then that way reduce the need for, for raw materials. You already see quite quite some interesting innovations. Um, some brands like like Patagonia are focusing on the um, on the actual product um, reuse. Then you have different players like CNA uh, or HM focusing on recycled materials. Or a number six and number one here uh, new types of innovations in the in the uh, fiber value chains like Spinova, Renews Hello, Infinity Fiber. Uh, trying to innovate how we can use recycled fiber or make them from, from different types of sustainable materials. Then what could it mean? What could circularity mean in, uh, in non-woven? It obviously starts from the raw material source. The, the more you can use natural fiber sustainably uh, produced, so with FSC or PEFC um, type of certifications, moving those in the value chain and making so that in pulp making, fiber making, you has, have as much as possible a closed loop ecosystem. And then as you move forward in the value chain to fabric production, garment making, end consumers, that also these parts are uh, as circular and sustainable as possible, and you can prove it back to the origin of the source. When then consumers dispose the products, hopefully after, uh, after reuse, then the question is, do you design the products to be um, degradable, recyclable, reusable? And then how do you take back these materials to the system? That's, that's, that's typically a very difficult question, obviously. Uh, can you use the uh, raw material, the primary material again? Do you have to downcycle it? Or do you use, um, I would say, more energy intensive uh, processes to then get that, that material still back to the value chain, even though you break it back into its almost its chemical compositions. And then, uh, this is a discussion, especially in plastics, that I see interesting. What can you do chemically? Or can you even just burn the product, but capture the CO2, and then build, uh, build from those uh, components, again, uh, sustainable products? So it, circularity could also mean in the value chain that some of the natural fiber may also end up fixing problems in other value chains, such as plastics. Then what are the actions that uh, brand owners can, can think about on, on, on natural fibers? A lot of it co goes to the natural fiber side on forestation, making sure that the forest management practices are sustainable. And this is something where you have different certifications. Then you can shift uh, to man-made cellulosic fibers from more closed loop processes. And you have different examples like Lyocell here. And then there's also a question on what do you do with the actual uh, forestation, which is going to be an important decarbonization lever also. And, and it helps to build the story around sustainable operations. Looking at a sustainable forest use and, 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 and reforestation commitments, it's nice to see that many, many big uh, brands in the textile industry, HM, Inditex, PVH, GAP, are, are leveraging many of these, uh, these, um, these certification standards. There are, of course, always some challenges with it. FSC certification can be uh, challenging for smallholders, but PEFC can, can be um, also an alternative. The reforestation for me is is, a, I would say, a, a billion ton question when it comes to CO2. Looking at deforestation and reforestation and, and a 1.5 degree pathway or even 2 degree pathway, what would it look like globally? There's a clear need uh, to avoid deforestation. Today, we see an area of Greece being deforested every year. 
and, and we would need to drastically reduce the deforestation pace if we want to support a path towards um, uh, the Paris Agreement or, or otherwise 1.5 degree pathways. It will also require reforestation and the, and the scale of reforestation we need is also massive. Uh, you talk about one third of the US uh, land area by 2050 that we, we model when we say how much emissions there might be towards net zero globally and how much you may need to use then um, uh, negative carbon sinks uh, to fix this issue. And for that reason, it's for me, it's, it's, a, it's a necessity that we, we find ways uh, to do these forestation practices. And also when it comes to reforestation, it's important to re uh, think through how do you do that? Are you going for a, a cheapest way uh, to bind uh, CO2 or are you, are you working with um, natural species type of programs which obviously are more expensive? Then where it leads to is, is the choice of, of different uh, sustainable raw materials. There's increasing availability of different materials. Um, and when, when these are commercialized, there's obviously a question, how do you how do you build the brand? How do you build the consumer understanding? What are the man-made cellulosic fibers um, out there and how do they differ from anything that is not, for instance, uh, made out of plant-based fibers? P speaking out of experience, uh, my my spouse bought a dress, for instance, and, and that was out of Lyocell and, and, and consumer understanding how do you work with these different garments? How uh, and, and, and is it how is it different from anything else on the market? It's not a trivial thing, but what I also like that there's a, a clear sense of, of premium in many of these materials for consumers. Then when it comes to when it comes to the water energy efficiency, it's good to good to prioritize where to put the focus. We've been looking at um, uh, with many many brand owners. How does the value chain look like? Uh, how where can you have highest impact uh, to water, chemical, and, and and waste production issues? And it's clear that many of the issues in the value chain are related uh, to the material uh, processing and the raw material production side. So upstream of the value chain, and that's why the tra uh, transparency is also important. The waste side is is then typically a local issue. Uh, how do you influence, how do you make sure that the local local waste management processes allow to get back the fibers in the closed loop systems or otherwise dispose the products then responsibly and, and hopefully recover at least uh, then uh, some of the chemical components that, that get, get into the value chains. These are obviously not, not trivial uh, on, on how you solve this. And it's, it's interesting to see if you look at the different commitments different companies are making uh, on water consumption, chemical pollution or waste topics. We, we see increasing um, increasing targets and commitments. Some are uh, relying on, on different standards or approaches like the ZDHC uh, HC water, water, wastewater guidelines. Or there can be zero dumping type of um, type of uh, promises and commitments. What I also do see as, as a challenge, I, I, for instance, earlier today uh, spoke uh, to an emerging country uh, with an industrial player thinking, how can I how can I try to fix the waste issue of the different brands in the country? Because I recognize that if if there's a brand which is having no waste or no landfill type of promises, um, in, in countries with less developed systems when it comes to process waste management, it's not a trivial um, trivial issue to solve. But also the comp uh, corporate commitment can help to then develop in these countries, these systems. As people get into the business, they find viable ways of building, building waste management practices and that, that way um, influence how the whole waste management system in the, in the country works. So in a way, I, I, I do also believe in, in quite specific commitments that companies can make to fix the biodiversity and, and, and climate global warming issues. There's a range 
of actions that can be done on, on water, chemicals and, uh, and waste generation. There are issues on, on, on closed loop water use, on chemical pollution, uh, there's uh, compliance with different standards or, or with waste generation. Um, there are ways to, uh, ways to then try to influence the local, local waste management systems, but also then think through how do you design the product, how do you design it to be uh, less waste generating, what, how do you design also the packaging of, the, of those, and, and, and so on. And it, it easily gets quite specific with, uh, with solving many of these, these issues. They are not trivial. On, on, on chemical pollution side, um, as an ex example, there's, there's, there's obviously a need, uh, need to start building the capabilities of, of managing that, uh, tracking and managing uh, pollution. You can use uh, different kind of guidelines, um, either a restricted substance list or, or other, other stricter guidelines to then define what is the way to, to cover with the chemicals, chemicals issues. On supply chain traceability, I think this, is, this has been an interesting discussion over the past one or two years. How can companies go back to the raw material source and then, um, then demonstrate to consumers that their value chain is, is responsible? It's not always that you uh, have the opportunity uh, or the consumer may not have the focus and interest of, of checking off every single product, uh, what the transparency in the value chain is in the background, but this is for me more becoming a must-have in, uh, in the value chain. It's, it's a must-have also if you are building stories and if you are building propositions on, on significantly higher um, sustainability promise, which could be, for instance, the zero carbon type of promise of, of materials. A few things that I, I find interesting from the non-woven industry, um, they are these green track uh, systems, which is the case for Birla. There's the lensing related textile genesis tool, uh, being able to demonstrate also on a, on a map basis uh, where the materials are coming. And then there are the third party initiatives like Canopy or HIC index, which bring a way, at least for the brand owners, but also for the NGOs and most most educated consumers to look at how do how do how does the value chain comply against a much more nuanced core card of different initiatives. Won't go into the detail with the HIG index, um, but it's 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 for me an interesting interesting way um, in a very sophisticated manner uh, look at look at the different different type of criteria, reduce the need for uh, for company specific ways of reporting, company specific ways of, of delivering the sustainability uh, messages, and that way uh, create a standard for the industry to watch what um, to um, aspire for. So this is a, as a short intro before getting into, into the discussion or Q&A A mode. Uh, with the focus on sustainable material mix. How do you do that? And then how do you demonstrate that? Thank you. Thank you, Tapio. Very interesting and uh, a lot of food for thought. Uh, I can see that you've already kick-started um, many questions that have uh, come up from the audience. Uh, let me pick up the first one and then, you know, I'll keep also, you know, I have many questions that have come up in my head as, uh, as I heard you speak. So first question, which is uh, there on the chat is, given the issue of deforestation, what is the onus on the value chain to handle this with more responsibility? You know, uh, so whole, this thing about uh, forestry and responsibility of forestry, uh, I presume that's what... Uh, John D wants to know. Yeah. So, so deforestation issue is for me, it, it, it's a challenging one. Um, one, one interesting case that uh, for instance come to mind, um, there are industries such as the palm industry, where mm -hmm. we know that uh, people, people need to have edible oils, for instance, for their nutrition. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, you understand that there's deforestation issues with those. And, and then 
Uh, th this is relevant especially for brands uh, which are in in personal care products and beauty products, for instance. Yeah. How to how to prove the transparency uh, that you don't cause deforestation so that um, there's no deforestation issues related to any of, of those kind of raw materials. In non-woven, it's the same same thing. Having the full transparency back to the forests and seeing that there's no deforestation uh, related and uh, no no also land use issues that the soil is, for instance, degraded over time. So I, I think if you don't ask for that, if you don't ask for the full transparency and uh, avoidance of deforestation, it's, it's really hard to get there. No, thanks uh, for sharing that. I agree with you because uh, 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 in a way uh, it would be by the way of transparency and for that transparency, what I can think of if, if I was to just add from uh, Aditya Birla group perspective, uh, it is about uh, those, uh, you know, use of uh, tools and then also use of standards and certification. But, you know, uh, is it that uh, the uh, the uh, wood that I'm sourcing from, uh, is it from uh, certified forests uh, or, or, or so, 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 so use of a standard like PFC or FSC or uh, whatever is the uh, local one, uh, along with uh, a, a blockchain kind of tool uh, would uh, address issues around deforestation. I hope uh, uh, that addresses John's question. And uh, in, uh, so, you know, uh, Tapio, one thing that is coming to my mind is you, so you spoke about post-consumer waste for fashion and textile industry, you know, uh, where it's where it's easy to collect, you know, because it, it's the it's the woven uh, fiber that we are talking about. But when it comes to non-woven, you know, these these uh, these products are like wipes and, you know, so they're those more hygiene related products. So uh, what do you, you know, what are your thoughts on environmental footprint in case of, of these kind of ways that, you know, uh, any, any uh, examples, thoughts that you would have around that? I think that that links uh, uh, so the non-woven and, and its uh, its post-consumer waste handling is a bit similar also than I would say flexible plastics, which are really hard to get from the system and and, and recycle separately. Uh, in in many many developed economies, we already are collecting separately many many different substrates, and and increasing that level of sophistication in post-consumer uh, recycling. Um, and sorting it is quite quite challenging. So when when looking at how how do you solve these problems, I'm I'm increasingly thinking that there are many materials that can be recycled mechanically, um, like getting to single streams and back to systems. But there are also many materials which can be really hard uh, to then then recycle that way. And then the choice is obviously between landfill or its incineration. And, and there, uh, what do you do with the incineration? If you only recover the energy value, you you still lose quite a bit of the raw material. Sure. But if you do also capture the CO2 and you start to then create new products, which are hard to recycle, again, different chemicals or plastics. I think that um, that route, uh, power to X, material to X, waste to X type of route is the one that we need to pursue if we want to uh, achieve uh, full circularity also with these kind of products. And then for, for me, what it means for the non-woven industry, it is the acceptance that we may need to burn some products, but then when we do that, the more we can we can capture the CO2 and, and build something new out of it. That's how we achieve carbon circularity. Sure, I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Tapio. So another question which I can see in the chat box is, uh, that you talked about post-consumer waste for fashion or textile industry, where it's much is okay. So that's we've spoken about. So next question that I can see there is: Do we see targets on fixing or curbing the leakage of plastic materials? Presently, the amount of recycling is very low, and uh, I have that number on top of my head, so I can add that there. It's nine percent. So you know, it's very low. 
or moving away from plastic in certain sectors, especially disposables. Is that the is that the only option? So, so any thoughts around that? You know, it's linked to you know mm-hmm. disposability collection, uh, and uh, so, so do do you foresee? You know, uh, I mean, maybe uh, how, what are the trends pointing to? Is, do you think that uh, that could help? I think that that thought is the very challenging and interesting discussion on fiber versus plastics. And, and especially natural fiber versus plastics discussion, which is a hot topic obviously in packaging, and it also relates then to non-woven. And I, I think there are a couple of priorities there. Uh, one is uh, reaching circularity in plastics, which is not a trivial topic. And, and when, when working with that circularity question, you need to tap into all different ways of reaching that. It is, uh, it is first fixing the collection side, and as, as you avoid any any leakage to the system, then tapping into the three ways of of using that uh, that plastic, and same goes partly to fiber. You you mechanically recycle it, or you break it down into different components, so chemically recycle it. Uh, you might that way also get get to the different infinity fiber or spin nova type of uh, solutions on 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 recycling the fiber and or creating new products out of it, or then you pursue the the last resort, uh, which is burning burning this waste and and when you burn it uh capturing that co2 i believe that will be something that we will increasingly see in the next five to ten years as cost of uh, carbon capture and electricity goes down and you can start to work more on on this chemical route and for me it's, it is quite relevant especially for those regions where waste handling systems and waste management systems are less developed so it could be some of the mega cities of, of Africa or, or Southeast Asia. In, in, in those regions, uh, finding solutions where you make sure that there's limited, if uh, hopefully no landfill. And then if there's burning of waste, making sure that you capture, capture those, uh, those materials that you can from that process. Great, no interesting discussions and uh, you know, requesting the audience to keep these questions coming. Another related one, uh, Tapio, which I can see there is uh, that, uh, you know, uh, is the world moving away from plastics to nature based materials like viscose, cotton and paper in the non woven industry? And, you know, if yes, then why would that be? So in a way links to what you've spoken about for non voters That's one question I can see there. The answer is obviously yes, but the question is at what pace and scale? Yeah. Um, and it, it's it's related to choices of, of companies and brand owners, but also consumers. Um, when it comes to, uh, again, the plastics versus fiber, uh, petrochemical versus fiber discussion, there are solutions where you you just need to tap into the, I would say, the fossil sources because of, of barrier properties, because of fabric properties, uh, also because of cost issues. Um, some of the natural fibers uh, may not be, may, may be unreachable uh, in, in some solutions. But then if, if you say that premium uh, means sustainability or, or sustainability means premium for many consumers, I do foresee opportunities of increasing the share of the uh, of the natural fibers in, in non-woven and under and, and the use of, of, of lyocell or viscose type of products. What I'm as a consumer also thinking is that I, I still don't, I just don't see it. It's you, you need to be quite an expert uh, as a consumer or quite sophisticated consumer to understand uh, those differences. And then for me, it, it means that if you can if you can do it from the branding perspective, make it more easy for consumers to understand what it, what does it mean that it's it's sustainable, it's circular, it's it's nature based, it's non fossil, for instance. Those are the kind of messages that I believe are, are easier for consumers. One one interesting example is that we, we did a uh, broad packaging survey. What, how do consumers see in 12 countries uh, the sustainability of different packaging substrates and fiber based cartons? They, they, they come number one in most of the regions and plastics, uh, regardless if that's recycled or if that's recyclable or if that's bio based plastics, 
comes a much, much uh, further away uh, in consumers' minds. There are some regions where there's a bit more nuanced discussion, uh, but I think that the underlying issue with consumers is that they, they understand the linkage uh, to crude oil use, which they associate with, with global warming. And, and if, you, if you bring that also to non-woven, you help to educate the consumer that there, are, there can be also petrochemical based products and fibers in the system. Um, I, I do foresee an opportunity to build, build brands and build uh, products and value propositions, which are, which are building on, on natural fibers and, and that way uh, on reliance from, on detachment from, from fossil use. Yeah, I know, uh, Tapio, and therefore, you know, in a way you answered uh, another question that we have there, uh, which Mark has asked. He's saying, how well is brand message translated to consumer experience while using sustainable materials? So, you know, um, so do you think you would like to add anything to what you just said uh, on this question that how how well is it it's translated, you know? brand message versus consumer experience. You gave the example of your wife uh, buying the dress made of lyocell. And believe you me, till till I, you know, I um, uh, started to wear uh, viscose as a fabric. Once you are introduced to that, uh, I'm not able to go back to any other. So, you know, uh, but uh, yeah, so how well is, uh, if you want to add anything to this question. I would I would ask the question: Can you make a brand a value proposition that is distinct enough and it's understandable enough and it's not mixed too much uh, with the non-sustainable brand value promise? Uh, if you say that this, if you if you analyze the market and you say that I have 30 or 50 percent of my of my potential consumer base who are willing to choose sustainably and pay even premium for that. Then how do you make sure that you you then bring a product which they can can associate with their premium choice? And uh, you see some of these kind of brands. It could be e-cover on on some of your laundry products. Uh, it could be different things. In in the textile industry, if it's a product line, if it's a brand value proposition, I think it it needs to be quite simple and and, and distinct enough. But it also means if there's a if there's a sense of novelty that the different worries consumers have are well articulated and, and, and sold. So, so if you, for instance, say that I have a novel fiber that the consumer knows that it's not going to be destroyed if I wash it a bit differently, uh, those kind of bad experiences easily then uh, start to <laughs> start to spread. Uh, or that if it's a nat natural based, does it mean that it degrades and does it affect my skin, for instance? So. The consumer education being simple, but at the same time answering any worries that consumers may, might might have, I think that that has to be the, also the risk perspective part of the value promise, so that it feels safe, it feels premium, it feels sustainable, and the right choice. Now that's an excellent point. That how to uh, kind of think of uh, during use, post use, uh, even care, etc., and uh, in a way. Uh, that means that when we talk about non-woven wear, uh, uh, the way consumers would use non-woven versus woven could be different. But uh, yeah, no, uh, makes sense uh, what you just explained. So you know, uh, Pio, we we've spoken about you know brands and use of different materials. Given that uh, when we are talking about uh, you know, ability to sustain uh, is how we look at sustainability and therefore uh, uh, when one of the pillars that corporates, especially the ones uh, with brands look at, taking a stewardship position in product is an important pillar of ability to sustain. So, you know, would you like to share an example of or, you know, uh, if there's a this thing on importance of sustainable materials in this product stewardship, that how do we link uh, a material you use to a product that you would create, and therefore how it is very relevant to a or to a, a brand's ability to sustain? 
that is a, a billion dollar question again. Uh, how do you how do you link the sustainable material used to uh, then, for instance, the um, value promise also of the product? And mm. what, it, what it could mean in non-woven, it could mean no fossil used, for instance, could be a strong value proposition. And in some other products, it can be zero carbon uh, or zero fossil carbon or, or, cl uh, or climate neutrality. But I think uh, there's there's room to innovate what those promises could be, and and once you do that, it becomes also very clear if it's for instance no fossil used, that it's it is natural based fiber, and and th those kind of promises may be easier um, than to just build on um, on a fiber fiber name like 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 Lyocell. They they can be effective. Some consumers will recognize they will become more recognizable. But then there are also other claims that that may may ease the consumer to understand uh, what is it that is being delivered uh, with with this interesting name of a product. Sure, Tapio. So we're almost reaching the end of our time, and I'm going to ask you these two questions quickly that have come up. Uh, question from Elena says: How do you think the EU Plastics Directive will affect the viscose development? especially if viscose is considered as plastic. And if this is the case, what will be the impact on lyocell capacity? And will there be alternatives as well? So, uh, yeah, Tapio. Uh, yeah, like that's a tough question, and I'm fully aware of that, that discussion. How I, so first, how I understand the, uh, the question is that whenever you treat different natural fibers enough and you change their chemical composition. Yeah. Do they become a different material in that? And obviously the more you get uh, close to something, uh, let's say petrochemical type or hard to recycle, the more then you can say that it's, it, it's a problem for the system unless you have a fully circular loop. So it also may be that in the longer longer um, outlook if you look towards 20, 30, 40 or 50 as, as we look, uh, get to closer circularity. These issues again um, change how, how people look at them. But then uh, with the uh, SUP, depending how it lands, uh, I, I don't have the answer how it exactly will impact, impact the, um, the capacities. If you are relying on, on less um, less uh, converted products, which do not then fall under SUP. I think uh, if you, for instance, are in viscose, there could be could be shift towards other man-made cellulosic fibers, and it, it may be an opportunity also to start playing with some of those other alternatives. If it plays so that there actually is no natural fiber alternative, it doesn't mean that you would shift uh, to polyesters, for instance. Uh, but it could mean that the industry just accepts that there are certain certain costs related to using any of these, and it's it's the it's what what you have to just pay to fix fix the circularity. That that's how I think think about also SUP that you you need to bear some of the cost of the products so that it it's it's economic uh, to get the circularity to work. Thanks, thanks, Tapio, and we almost, uh, you know, a minute to go. Uh, so thanks, Alina, for that question, and we'll be happy to connect with you to explain a little more on uh, how uh, viscose is not plastic because it's not coming from the fossil fuel route, and and, and happy to uh, pick that up and take that discussion forward. Uh, we have one question there, which is, says. Uh, uh, that com the, co the companies that sell non-wovens for industrial use, uh, how do they convince their customers that sustainability is important enough uh, to pay a premium for? Interested in how to make the business model make sense given the difference between end users' mindset and use of these types of non-woven applications? A very specific questions. Uh, question. Um, uh, so we. Uh, again, would park it in that bucket where we'll be happy, Mr. Anonymous or Miss Anonymous, to to take it with you uh, forward. Please feel free. We missed any question or if if something comes to your mind on uh, this email that you can see on your screen, inquiries dot convergex at aditya dot com. Uh, thank you, Tapio, for making time and having these interesting discussions. And uh, thank you, everyone who joined here for. Uh, 
for being here and making time. Uh, hope you enjoyed uh, listening into us as I enjoyed listening to Tapio and having this conversation uh, with him. S stay tuned on, you know, look out for um, more upcoming webinars. Uh, so good night, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, take care of yourselves. Stay, stay safe. Thank you.